Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction and the kind words. Thank you to Joe for, for inviting me to, to come here and, and to say a few words on governance in Denmark, how it is constructed and how it works. I have been looking forward to it. I don't know as much about Ireland as all of you do, and I shall be very careful not to comment on your situation, but I have been engaging a lot in how we have developed our own society, and that is what I will um, speak on. Democracy in Denmark started with our constitution in 1849, and it really was the beginning of a disaster. We were not good at it, and the first thing democracy did was to try and resolve the border issue with Germany that had been haunting us for decades. And like any other European country, we had had a border region where you had mixed affiliations within the actual people living in the border region, and the democratic government got itself carried away with the national spirits and simply decided to include the region in the country. A brave and bold move, hugely supported by the entire Danish population, which failed to understand that in Prussia, the new chancellor, Mr. Bismarck, was not one who appreciated a unilateral step in foreign policy on a neighboring country that was much smaller, and he first politely asked Denmark to revoke this legislation, and as we said, we had no intention to do so, he raised an army together with Austria, and he went after us. There was a debate in Parliament on the implication of that war before it started, and uh, there was a firmness exchange of words where one of the more moderates said that the likelihood of an army raised by 80 million people to beat one raised by 4 million people was quite big. The defense minister said that there was by no means certain that the big army would always win. Others said that, on the other hand, it was by no means certain that it would lose either. Now, it didn't. It led to the war of 64, until very, very recently, the last war Denmark fought. We lost it badly to Bismarck, who took one-fifth of the territory, our largest industrial city, and a huge part of what was real Denmark. And therefore, we also had a situation going into the 20th century where many Danes, a huge Danish minority, lived within the, the, the borders of, of Germany. And it took us more than half of the 20th century to come to terms with the fact that we had lost so badly and we had also lost part of our population to our neighboring country. So the, the, the modern Danish history really is a history of how to cope with disaster. And that is basically what, is, what we started doing as we approach the uh, 1900s. Poor, devastated, reduced, and with very, very low spirits. And, and add to that that our main trait, which was agriculture, faced globalization, not the present one, but the real one, when steamships, railroads, telegraphs suddenly made the world much smaller and our agriculture couldn't compete with the US, with Russia, with South America. So the economy also went bankrupt. Not that the state went bankrupt, but we really faced severe economic difficulties. And that provoked the first of three major revolutions that marked the building of modern Denmark. All three of them peaceful, but all three of them 
in the course of the 20th century, changing Danish society to its very roots. And the people who started the first revolution were the peasants, the farmers, and they demanded at the same time better education, better access to education. They demanded part of power, part in power, and at the same time they reorganized the entire production life in Denmark, forming cooperatives, moving towards producing high quality dairy products and bacon, founding a major export of eggs, butter and bacon, especially to Britain. It was during that period we built the economy on providing the Brits with breakfast. And we have basically been making a living of that for almost a hundred years. So whenever you see a Brit eating bacon and eggs and butter, know that that is going directly into the treasury of, uh, of Denmark. We don't eat much bacon ourselves, but we know how to produce the stuff. You can't buy the stuff in Denmark, it's all exported. It's not completely true, but almost. Now, the peasants or the farmers founded the notion that the only way of achieving real part in power was to educate. And they started this strong movement for adult education, long, lifelong education. And they insisted that the young folks, when they left home at the farms, before they became farmers themselves, would have to go to whole high schools, not as a, an academic curriculum, but to be taught to be citizens. They had to know the workings of society. They had to know how to become democratic citizens and utilize the potential of being so. And at the turn of the century, it became untenable for the right who had been governing the country together with the king and the conservatives without including the peasants. It became impossible to do that. And in 1901, we introduced the system of parliamentary rule in Denmark, which has never been broken since, except one occasion, which basically means and it was also the term used by the peasants, no one at the level of the parliament and no one above parliament. Which also means that any government ruling Denmark can only do so as long as the, there is no majority against it in the Danish parliament, in the Folketing. The Folketing has a firm grip of the executive and if the executive loses the confidence of the majority in Parliament. Parliament can force the Prime Minister any day, any time of the year, to call it fresh elections. And this is not a theoretical construction. This is a power the Parliament is exercising, and which basically means that since 1901, no government has been able to rule without assuring itself constantly the confidence of the parliament. I'll come back to how it works in practical terms. The farmers, once in power, started to build a society much to their liking, but they were challenged early on um, by another big chunk of the population who felt excluded and didn't trust the governance system and didn't trust society as a whole, namely an increasing number of workers in the cities. They formed trade unions. The trade unions formed the Labour Party and the Labour Party began to insist to be part of power. And it took a couple of decades for the workers to be well organized enough and also to be uh, represented in Parliament strongly enough to form their first government and in 1929, the workers formed 
a very stable majority government together with a smaller party, and that government ruled the country from 1921 and deep into the Second World War, into the German occupation. Building the social constructs of modern Denmark. As the social democrats began to establish their grip on power, they also realized that they had to establish a social system that would enable those who were not part of employment to spend their time during unemployment at education. And the social democrats and the trade unions adopted a lot of the ideas the farmers had about organizing cooperatives and organizing adult training and education. And it became a major focus to keep the unemployed engaged in society. And if you couldn't do it through employment, do it through training. And there was um, introduced huge economic and social reforms to counter the world economic crisis in the early 30s. That was very bad in Denmark, as it was all over Europe. Um, and at the same time, of course, there was a growing fear uh, of the intentions of Hitler and of what the continued dispute on the border would entail if Hitler acquired power. There is a very strong symbolism in the fact that the very night in 1933, when Hitler was appointed chancellor in Germany, an historical economic and social compromise was reached in Copenhagen between the Labour Party in government and the opposition Farmers Party, founding what we would later call the modern, modern welfare state. That is where the big social reforms were made at the depth of the crisis with very high unemployment figures. The political parties came together and decided to try to cope with the crisis in Parliament and through Parliament. And when the, when the uh, politicians later had to explain to their electorates why they had entered into this compromise with one another, why they had broken their promises not to, they referred to Germany, they referred to the fact that in Denmark, Parliament would prove that it could make the decisions that in other countries only strong men could make. So there was a very deliberate mobilization around democracy, around what the politicians at the time didn't actually use the term democracy, they used the term rule of the people and by the people. As the social democrats settled in in the governing offices and settled in controlling the small civil administration at the time, they also began to feel ownership of society. And they began to change their attitude to the basic institutions of society, the kingdom or the royal family, the defense, the administration, and they compromised on all these um, uh, founding pillars of Danish society and became, in effect, owners of society. And with a very sort of simplistic view I give you here, you could basically say that from that period and until the end, end of the century, Denmark was ruled by and large by the Labour Party. There were years when a centre-right coalition was in place, but basically, fundamentally, the, the Labour commanded 40% of the electorate, and they would normally form coalitions to govern the country and to continue the, um, the, um, the advances in building up uh, the welfare state. The, um, the ideas and philosophy of modern administration and of 
steering the economy or managing the economy in order to create economic growth was in Denmark introduced, as in most of Europe, from abroad. It was not an invention we made. It's always ironical today to recall that the people who asked us to make big government, of course, was America. When they came with the Marshall Recovery Aid after the Second World War, there were two basic conditions attached to the aid. One was big government, and the other was European cooperation. And we were smart pupils in the sense that we did what the Americans told us. We started to construct a big government. And that is the government which is basically elaborated ever since. It's a government that can actually do two things. It can steer, manage, regulate the economy, and over time, it also developed the capacity to provide for citizens. Now, this does not mean that the Danish government has been running enterprises or has been part of the economy. Actually, the Danish economy has always been very open and very liberal in the sense that the government does not go in as an economic actor. But it does regulate and it does control and as we moved into the 50s and the 60s, it started to develop a system by which citizens, who happened also to be the taxpayers, that the citizens, the taxpayers, became entitled to welfare. And government started to muscle up in order to be able to provide pensions, health care, education, and all the rest of it to the citizens. And actually, the prime minister who designed, labor prime minister who designed this system, went to a very uh, important election in 66, proposing to the Danish electorate two inventions of his and his government. First, direct taxation, which means that before you get your salary, before you get your salary, you pay your tax. So we collect the tax at the source, which basically means for most people that they don't understand anything but what is left. So they have to pay the tax before they ever see the money, and they forget they ever have it. Or they don't forget it, but they can't. I mean, it's a very different mental pro process to only get half your salary because the other half has been paid for taxes or to get the full payment and then have to pay it back. So he introduced that and then he introduced something we didn't know of, VAT taxes, 25% today of everything, on everything. So we have world records in taxes. And that was built through the 60s and the 70s, ever increasing taxes. It, it works in a way where it is literally a police, a life insurance social police that you take out to cover any eventuality you can think of. So you pay half your salary in taxes, you pay 25% VAT on anything you do. You blink your eyes, you pay 25% to the government. And people, frankly, don't like it. But they do like that over the 60s and 70s and the 80s, a system was constructed by which the government will pay any social expense in any context, from child care to elderly care, hospitals, schooling, universities. When my kids, adult kids, kids are at university, each of them are paid five years a salary by the government, enough to live off, not a lot. They all work because they want more. They all do. 
but they are paid what amounts to 8,000 euros. No, 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 no. Uh, 600 euros per month, per month, every month for five years to go to any, to any education in order to incentivize young people to take education and in order to address the, the inequity of parents being able to pay for, for, for long educations versus parents who are not able to do so. All this is, of course, expensive. It entails big government, and, 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 and that is driving, um, that is driving um, this huge um, sector, um, which over the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s were gradually professionalized. And that entails a third wave of inclusion, education, and revolution after the farmers uh, and the workers, the great revolution of the 70s and the 80s was the women. The women started to do exactly as the peasants had done and the workers had done. They started to insist on being better educated. They wanted a stronger place in the working space. And they went out in their great majority from low salary, uneducated workplaces at home or in the industry into higher and more advanced education and a much, much stronger position in society. And as this process happened in the 70s and the 80s, the society changed profoundly. And as we entered into the 90s, not one family was a family the way it used to be before. Not one woman was a woman the way women used to be before. Not one man was able to be a man the way we used to be before the, um, the 70s and the 80s. And indeed, not one kid was brought up the way they used to be um, after this revolution. So this was completely changing society once again. But it also meant that as we approached the turn of, um, of the century, we had this uh, strange, fragile um, economy that by some standards are ext is extremely strong and by others, other standards and by other parameters, extremely vulnerable. And I give you a few figures just to give you a sense of this very strange economy that we're running um, and, and also it will give you an impression of the challenges we also are facing. And don't get after me if one or two figure here is not exactly precise. Norway and all Sweden and all Finland may on some of the accounts be just above us or just at the side of us. But basically, at the turn of the century, in the 2000s, we Danes had the highest rate of employment on earth. More Danes worked and contributed to the economy than in any other economy in the world. Now how come? The women. All Danish women work. You will find a few who don't. But basically, Danish women have work. They have some degree of education and they have work. And so the demand means highest employment ratio of any country. At the same time, we also have a world record in the percentage of Danes who are receiving public allowances. We have more people being passively taken care of by the taxpayers than in any other country. Pensioners, sick people, students, um, unemployed. The number of people that we pay every month to go at home or to go to be educated or trained is higher than in any other country. It's a huge burden on the welfare system to support all these people and of course the ratio between those who work and those who are receiving 
as you say, passive care, the ratio between the two, of course, is not trivial. We are also the country in the world who are collecting most taxes. For any who are in the lower middle income segment and above, you pay effectively half your income of every euro earned. And if you're a little above that level, if you are higher middle class or above, you pay effectively up to 60% of your entire income in direct income taxes. World records, not trivial either. We have the highest percentage of the overall economy plowed into public um, administration of any market economy country. So a higher percentage, approximately one-third of the BNP is plowed in for public funds and administered by our politicians and our, our administration. At the same time, we were always ranking among the top five most competitive countries in the world. Sometimes number two, sometimes number three, never below five. And any OECD, World Economic Forum, World Bank ranking. So an extremely competitive country. Have dropped a bit now, I think we are 12th um, um, presently because we have been suffering from policies over the last 10 or 15 years, but, uh, but uh, a very competitive economy and, um, and at all other levels or indicators, the richest, the highest educated, whatever you take, we would normally rank among the top five together with the other Scandinavian countries. So you have this country where basically we pay a lot of taxes, we spend a lot of money, it's all sort of very tight, and, and as you can imagine, if the ratios are tipping just a little bit, essentially if we are poorly governed for just a short time, we spend more money than we earn, and then we spend a lot more than we earn, and then we're in trouble. Right now we are not, but um, this represents to some a living a model of socialism, and you have a strong segment of Danish political uh, debate, which basically claims that in a system like this, the individual is losing responsibility for her or his own fate, and that the high taxes and heavy regulation is killing initiative, entrepreneurship, and is basically wearing down the wealth of the country. To others, this very model is in a way liberating the individual from his or her social context and it is in that effect the country, together with the other Scandinavian countries, where the American dream is a reality. Anyone has the means to go anywhere and anyone and no one is obliged to care for their own social responsibility in the sense of having to stay at home to take care of your parents or, or not being able to find childcare for your children. Now, whether you look upon it one way or the other is, of course, a matter of political um, and, 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 and personal discussion. To me, it is extremely interesting that when we research into how this perceived total social freedom, how that influences the choice of the individual, it's to me striking to see that when you free people from their social responsibility, most people choose to be social. They spend time they give priority to spending time with their children and with their parents, with their elderly, but of course some don't. And this is of course also a, a, a matter of, of discussion uh, in, in Denmark. 
um, the center of gravity in the Danish political system is not about this system or not. No elected Danish politician will put this system into question. And if she does, she will not be elected. The entire political debate is about how to run the system and how to ensure that it will not be destroyed by the increased global competition. So it's really about the, and again I'm simplifying the, the right, send right saying we need to lower expenses and taxes a little bit in order to protect the system against the competition, um, uh, the global competition, as opposed to the center left saying we need to invest even more in adult education and in upgrading the unemployed in order to be sure that the very, very high employment is maintained. So this is the debate, how to preserve this system. And this is where the political dividing lines are running. So how does this system function in a day-to-day -day, uh, practice? And I will highlight three factors that, that may be of interest also in, in the Irish context. Um, the inclusiveness of the system and the sense of ownership in the broad public, of course, is something that is built over a whole century. But it is there. And people do feel that the system does provide for them. And they do feel that they have a level of guarantee that the taxes that we're all paying are actually spent on us. Now, it's not that we trust our politicians or that we trust our civil administration. We don't. So what do we do when we don't trust them? We put up control system and we have a lot of them. The transparency in public spending in Denmark is almost 100%. If the ambassador invites one of you for a luncheon in Ireland, completely within his mandate, I can, as an editor, under the Freedom of Information Act, ask to see the bill that the ambassador paid with my taxpayer money. And I will print it in the paper, and I will see how much he paid for the wine, whether he had a whiskey, who were the guests, and this is true for anyone spending public money. Our former Prime Minister got into deep trouble and almost destroyed his career because the press found out that he had spent public money to buy two draft beers. At the time, he was the Minister of the Exchequer. And he had been sitting in a bar with no public purpose. He had drunk two huge pints of beer. And he had filed the receipt and got compensation. And the only reason he survived was because he claimed it was pure mistake it was simply, I mean, out of his wallet, he hadn't really, and he had no, it was caused completely stupid, he would never do it again, it was not intentional, it was a failure of the system that it hadn't stopped the reimbursement of the couple of euros that it was about. But for the electorate, this was about an elected politician spending taxpayers' money on a pint of beer, which he, of course, should pay himself. And this is not theory, it's practice. And the tabloids in Denmark, their favorite history, their favorite take on politicians is to go out, to follow them on a travel somewhere in the world, to go through their bills and their expenses, and to nail them on it. And of course, this is creating a very, very strong discipline. Because you know, as a civil servant, as an ambassador, or as a politician, 
that there is no hiding any public expense. So that is not where the real difficulty is. The real difficulty is, of course, how to provide health, childcare, education, research, best for least money. That's, of course, not trivial, and we have an ongoing debate on how much to ask private companies to provide these services paid by taxpayers' money. So, so um, we have a very, very accurate and very particular view of how to spend this money. And you don't get away, you don't get away in our system with misspending public money. That, of course, people will say that in the hospitals, the way they're organized, will misspend billions of kroner, and they probably do. But still, every Danish taxpayer pays or spends half the amount of the average American on health. Half the amount. And it's all public. So there's no simple function between uh, public and private uh, in this regard. So, the second feature of the way we govern is the fact that since the beginning of 1900s, all, or virtually all Danish governments have been coalition governments. No single party can rule. They all have to form coalitions. And these coalitions are not fixed. They are very dynamic. So basically all parties at some point have been in coalition with all other parties. Which also means that all parties are striving to become accepted as potential coalition partners in future governments. And all these governments are relying on the backbenchers of these various parties to actually vote for their policy in Parliament, otherwise they will not survive. So that means that government has to work very closely with Parliament for every sort of legislation and very briefly uh, 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 the way it works is the government is presenting um, based on the public administration um, a proposed legislation it will then go into a parliamentary committee which is where the backbenchers basically are and there there will be the traffic committee the agricultural committee most notably the European committee and the politicians from the various parties who are members of this particular committee will develop a sort of sub-community between them on that particular sphere of governance. And they will chew the legislation, propose amendments, um, and they will basically do the political deal. And once the committee is agreed or has established a firm majority, it will go back into the plenary of the, um, of the Folketing. But the real political debate and compromising is taking place in the committees. That is where the backbenchers, that, where, that is where the politicians are doing the real work, behind closed doors, normally. And the dynamic here is that when a compromise is found regulating, say, primary education, just had a big reform of that, if you are a part of that compromise, then you have a de facto right of veto until after another election. Let me explain how this works. The five parties from across the political spectrum that have now agreed the reform of primary education, after, in a global compromise, after next election, if the majority changes, another majority cannot change this legislation unless all five parties agree. 
They can then say, if they can't get the fifth party to agree to a new reform, they can say, we will change this compromise after next election, which creates a very long landing field or landing strip for reforms. If we all agree, we can just do it overnight. But if you don't, you have a, have a break. And this means, of course, that even if you don't really agree with, the, the, with parts of the reform, even if you would rather play the part of the opposition, that will, at the same time, if you do so, and you're of course free to do so, mean that you have no influence on this particular piece of legislation in this election period, nor in the next. Because even in the next, those who are now in government or majority can block a reform. Do you get this strange system? It's not in the Constitution. It's the way it works. But it, the practical result is that all responsible political parties are trying to be part of these across-the-board important pieces of the legislation. So it's a very, very strong motor for consensus. And it creates normally in most fields a very broad majority supporting major reforms in Parliament. And of course in, in the Europe Committee any piece of European legislation has to be presented to the Parliamentary Committee on Europe before the government can go down and approve it in the Council of Ministers. Everyone at all also. So the last thing on, uh, on explaining how the system works is the very fact that I've been alluding to um, that government is huge. Not the government as such, not the executive stuff, but I mean we have a lot of public um, of civil service. And the way it is constructed is you have what you call the central administration sitting in Copenhagen close to the government, serving the government. It's apolitical. When the, I worked for the Danish Prime Minister for six years. When the Danish Prime Minister I worked in his cabinet as a civil servant, non-political, I was among the top four advisors in the cabinet. It was one of three deputies to the State Secretary. Even the State Secretary, the top civil servant in the country, the closest advisor to the Prime Minister, does not change with the government. The Prime Minister walks out the door alone. The only person that walks in with the new Prime Minister is the press spokesman. There's no one else. The entire administration just stays put. And this means, of course, that the civil administration, in a way, is conservative, not in the political sense, but in the sense that when the new government starts, it will start by saying, we change everything. We just start from one end, and we change everything. And the administration, who was, of course, deeply involved in establishing what was, will say, well, Minister, um, we are ready. Perhaps we start somewhere with one bit. We change the educational system. Let's look at that. As you remember, Minister, your party was part of the compromise made two years ago. So, of course, the reform we will now prepare is for after next election. But let's start on that, Mr. Minister. So, it's a system where the administration is very loyal to the elected politicians, but it doesn't really float with the wind. It has a keel, and it takes direction from the elected politicians, but it doesn't change overnight. And that goes, it takes a lot of thinking in the cabinets before you actually move to doing new legislation. And the other thing that is particular is that at the central level, in Parliament and the central administration, all the rules and regulations are established, and all you are entitled to as citizens will be established at the central level. But providing the services, providing the welfare, education, child care, the, um, the um, elderly care, all of that is actually provided for at the local level.
by the local government. So the local governments are elected on a ticket to provide better services for you, the local electorate, with a given sum of money the municipality is entitled to collect in taxes. Which means that if you have two municipalities, and we do, who have the same amount of money, you have a de facto competition who creates the best schools, the best hospitals, the best living conditions for citizens, and people move according to the services provided at the local level, and they hold their local politicians accountable. Why can't you provide this, that, or the other in this municipality when the neighboring municipality can do so? Why do we pay 2% higher taxes in this municipality compared to the other? Why are you at the low end of the, the number of lessons taught in public schools and the other municipality is at the high level? Why do you have 10 children uh, in, the, um, in the child care adults and the others only have seven? So that is the discussion at the local level and it's, 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 it's holding local politicians accountable to actually providing more efficient um, welfare at the local level. Now, let me conclude. On all these accounts that I have been alluding to, of course, our society, like Ireland, is walking a thin line. It's all delicate balances, and they are all challenged by the electorate, by the press, and the public debate, Every day, we are as bad and as, as unsatisfied with our political system as you are. Warning signs are everywhere, and we struggle to keep aloof and, and to keep these balances without losing track or, 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 or without being completely overrun in a global competition. And it will comfort you to know that just as you are critical about your political system, it's also a huge debate in Denmark how we can improve our political system. And if I spoke about the present government as nicely as I had done to you, in Denmark they would laugh. <laughs> but despite the harsh criticism of your political elite, I sense also having listen to the debates over the last 24 hours here, that your ability and your willingness to engage in this discussion is actually a very important part of democracy and to take that as a token of your democracy perhaps as being not quite as broken as you tend to think yourself. Much may be wrong in the state of Ireland, but not your courage to address the evils, nor your determination to act. So that's what commands far beyond your borders and your shores, sympathy for the difficulties that you have been facing, and respect for the actions that you have been, that you have been taking. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for that absolutely fascinating uh, contribution, Bo.